So welcome to the first um, the, the session before the reception drinks uh, for best pediatric medical <laughs> paper and uh, nursing paper. Um, I welcome you all uh, and Tina, uh, who is my co-chair. Before going ahead with start of the session, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, thank you to the sponsors. Uh, please download the app for navigation and selecting the sessions and also for interaction. Um, please wear your name badges every time you're around the convention center. Please turn off on your uh, silent mode or vibrator mode on the mobile phones. And uh, please join us after this session uh, for the welcome reception and then for the pediatric dinner. So we'll start the session with uh, the first talk uh, first presentation from Dr. Manon, who is a French-Australian and a current intern at the Austin Hospital, uh, having completed her biomedical and medical studies at the University of Melbourne. She has a keen interest in critical care and particularly the role of intensivists in the end-of-life discussions and care. And she's presenting on deaths in pediatric tertiary hospital shifting away from ICU. Dr. Manon. Thank you very much. Um, so as you've heard, I've, I'm Manon Odege. I'm an intern at the Austin. I'll be speaking about deaths in a pediatric hospital shifting away from the intensive care. So in the developed world, most pediatric deaths are now in children with chronic illnesses rather than uh, after accidents or acute injury, and follow withdrawal or withholding of life-sustaining treatment rather than with full treatment still in situ. The proportion of deaths that follow withdrawal or withholding of care varies greatly both over time, where it has increased over the previous few decades, and in different countries with different cultural, religious, and legal backgrounds. Um, withdrawal and withholding of treatment is mostly studied from an intensive care perspective, both NICUs and PICUs, but there's a small but growing amount of research that is also looking outside of ICU. And there's a growing push internationally towards advanced planning or advanced care planning as we um, know it in Australia, for an intervention-free end of life, including death outside of the in ICU and including where children never go to the ICU in their entire journey. So um, I conducted an audit um, aimed to describe the practice of withdrawal and withholding of care at our centre, both within and outside of the intensive care and the evolution since 2007 when a similar audit was conducted. We also wanted to describe the characteristics of the children who died outside of intensive care but on, in hospital, so in the wards, versus those who died in ICU. It was a respective review of medical records, a descriptive for all paediatric inpatient deaths at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne from April 2015 to April 2016, which was actually the last year of paper records at that hospital before the transition to the electronic medical record system. Um, results were compared to 2007 data that one of my um, supervisors did back in 2007, and chi-squared tests were used for comparison. So a withdrawal and withholding um, discussion was considered to be anything that involved the family. We didn't include discussions um, that didn't involve family that were just within physicians, as documented in the medical records that um, didn't necessarily explicitly say withdrawal or withholding, but were along those lines with best interest, futility, not for certain intervention, those kinds of things. Um, withdrawal of treatment was um, any uh, removal or de-escalation of treatment, regardless of whether that child also had treatment withheld, and withholding as treatment with children who only had care withheld. There are 101 cases over that one year that met criteria for the audit, and most deaths followed withdrawal and withholding of care, similarly to 2007 and similarly to international data. The median age at death was nine months with a range from zero days to 16 years, so a full range from neonatal to adolescent, um, keeping in mind that at the Royal Children's Hospital there are no deaths, there are no births there, they have to get transferred from a different hospital. Respiratory support was the most commonly withdrawn and CPR the most commonly withheld. Interestingly, ECMO was the most commonly withdrawn and with, second most commonly withdrawn and withheld, um, but with much fewer numbers. The majority of deaths were occurring in children that had pre-existing chronic conditions similarly to an international level. So what did we notice when we compared to 2007? Firstly, there was a shift towards earlier discussions around withdrawal and withholding of care. When we say the last admission, that means the admission in which the death occurred. The proportion of cases where discussions were initiated prior to the last admission was significantly greater. When also looking at all discussions amongst all children, the, the number of those that were occurring as late as the day of the child's death were significantly reduced. 
There was also a shift towards withholding of treatment rather than withdrawing, so non-initiation of invasive intervention rather than withdrawing of them. Not significant, but still an interesting trend. And again, there was a shift towards death outside of the intensive care, with a greater proportion of children dying on the wards rather than within the intensive cares, so both the PICU and the NICU. And there were nine cases that never went to ICU in their entire disease trajectory. So what was different about the children who died on the ward and the children who died in ICU? Firstly, they had care withheld rather than withdrawn. And everyone in the ward group had care withheld regardless of whether it was withdrawn. They also had earlier discussions with a much greater proportion of the cases initiating discussions around withdrawal or withholding of care prior to the last admission. And the amount of time between first discussion and death was much greater. They were significantly more likely to have palliative care involved at some point in this child's care and to have formal documentation using a treatment limitation form. Now, you look at the age at the top there and you would say, well, the massive confounder would be the fact that these children have had a lot more time to have these discussions. But the ICU group includes quite a large NICU population, whereas there were no neonates at all in the non-ICU group. So once we exclude neonates, that difference is much less significant. And if you look at the rest of the table, the rest of the significant differences between the groups that I've just described remain there, even when we exclude neonates. What about underlying disease? Well, there was some difference in having a greater proportion of oncology type diagnoses in the wards versus congenital, perinatal type diagnoses um, in the ICU. Again, once we exclude the neonates, this is less significant. What about previous hospital contact to have an opportunity to discuss this? Well, here it, you can tell that there's actually much greater hospital contact in terms of number of admissions and number of days in hospital for those that eventually died on the ward. Once again, though, once excluding neonates, that difference almost completely disappears. There is, however, still a difference between the contact in, with ICU, between the um, children who died on the wall and the children who died in the intensive care, but this probably doesn't reflect a loss of opportunity to discuss this, but rather a consequence of the discussions and of the decisions. So what's the role of ICU in all these discussions? In the 101 cases described, there were 254 discussions around withdrawal and withholding of care, and intensivists were involved in 62% of these discussions. As evident in the notes, they led the discussion in almost half the cases, so 43 plus 3 with the registrars. But this also doesn't include the 15% where it was not really clear from the notes, so it's probably as high as maybe half the cases. But we already saw that most deaths are occurring in the ICU, so how does this translate to the deaths that are occurring outside of the ICU? There were 22 children, and ICU led at least one discussion throughout that child's disease course in 18% of cases. They were present and having an input in at least one discussion for 41% of cases. There were five cases where they had an ICU admission in their final admission and then were de-escalated down to the ward as part of that final admission before death. And eight had prior ICU admissions where there was opportunity for those discussions to happen. And interestingly, there was one case that was never admitted to ICU, but had an ICU registrar involved in one discussion around withdrawal of withholding of care, which was in the setting of a PQ outreach um, discussion to the wards. And an interesting way of looking at it is for each individual discussion that ICU staff were having with families around withdrawal and withholding of care, there was almost one in 10 where that child was gonna eventually die on the ward. So what does this mean? There's been a shift towards earlier discussion about withdrawal or withholding of care, more treatment withholding, more deaths outside of ICU. These ward deaths are associated with more palliative care involvement, more treatment limitation forms, so formal documentation, more withholding and earlier discussions, including prior to the last admission. This is not accompanied with a significant change in difference in the age of these children or the underlying diagnoses or previous hospital contact to explain this change. And intensivists retain a very large role in these discussions, including for children who don't die in the ICU. So this is only scratching the surface and it's a respect retrospective audit, so I think there's definitely more research that's warranted in this um, area. There's already been a redesigning of the treatment limitation forms at the Royal Children's Hospital. Partly it's been adapted to being electronic, but um, based on this research. 
and clinical implementation, which is, I guess, what I hope to achieve here. So my suggestions to ICU clinicians involve palliative care. Discuss withdrawal and withholding of treatment for future admissions, even if the child is improving in the current admission. When they are deteriorating and likely to die, discuss withdrawal and withholding early and the potential transfer to the ward for a more intervention three death, free death there. Thank you very much. You still had a minute, but uh, any questions from the audience? I have a question. Um, I think you have highlighted some, but was, was there any difference in the uh, format of documentation between the two eras from 2007? I know we are getting more documentation focused and insistent. Was there any change in a formal documentation process during the two era? So um, there was in the sense that the treatment limitation form did not exist in 2007. Um, that was something that was brought in in between and it's actually called the treatment plan for children with chronic life-limiting conditions. Um, in terms of actual documentation, the large majority of it was in the main body of the notes in the form of family meeting and then a documentation of that. I didn't collect the data for the 2007 one, so it's hard for me to say how those were different, um, but at least that form did not exist in 2007. Was there, you might not have uh, looked at it, but again, it, patients are getting increasingly complex and more and more teams get involved. Was there any suggestion of number of people involved in these discussions and their varying ideas around how the end of life care plan should be evolving between the two eras which are quite distant? Mm. So I think I, I did look at how many teams were involved in each of the ch in each um, child's care, but the the emerging um, result that was the most interesting from that really was palliative care involvement, and that was the one thing that made the biggest difference, and that was the most strongly associated between the two groups, with um, the ward deaths having much more palliative care involvement and the ICU deaths having less. I also, which I didn't present here, um, separated the groups that had withdrawal of care and the groups that had withholding of care, and that same association exists there with the withholding of care, regardless of where the death occurred, being um, having much more palliative care involvement as well. Thank you. Any questions? I need a mic. Might need to just switch that on. Can you, um, obviously you've done a great deal amount of work reading through all these notes to find documentation. Can you tell me about what you think the limitations are by just relying... On, on, on documentation? Yeah, because presumably you only had that could classify them if it was written in the notes. Exactly right. And that's what, what's your view on what you may have missed? or? Yeah, so um, definitely agree that that's one of the main limitations of this. Um, and looking at the literature, most, most, um, most research internationally on this topic is retrospective, but the few that have done it prospectively, the, the bits of information that they've managed to gather, which you can't really hear, is the decision-making behind when to start discuss this. It's the, um, the reactions that the families are having at the time, which might not necessarily make it to the medical record. Um, it's the objections. It's all the intricacies around such complex decision-making that just don't make it to the medical um, documentation. So I definitely think that something prospective, which is what has been done a few times, um, and I do believe was done back in 2007, um, gives a lot of information about that, and might even give information about, you know, at the time of that document, at the time of that discussion, um, collecting the relevant data and then following the child up to see whether they eventually survive, um, die in ICU, die in the wards, or die at home. And there were quite a few documented um, instances where the family was expressing a desire to die at home, but that's just not a population group that I looked at. Thank you so much.